Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode five now of the Backyard Banter podcast. I'm Matt Harmon. You know me from NFL.com, football guys, reception perception, owning Charlie, the whole nine yards. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm here today with a really exciting guest. I'm happy to be talking to Josh Norris, who's the lead NFL draft guy over there at Roto World and NBC Sports. Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you. That's a better name on my resume than uh, Blurber from 8 to Noon and <laughs> guy who watches football and shares his opinion, which is the one I use all the time. Yeah, I, that's what I normally say, too. Like whenever somebody's like, what's your title? I'm like, I, I, I don't football. know. And some people are like super into titles. Yeah. Um, I, I've worked with a few of those that that want like, well, I want to be editor and all these things. I'm like, does it really matter? Um, it doesn't. And, and I, I hate the word expert too. Oh, not the as, expert is the worst. Not as much as I hate the word scout. Like I get called scout all the time too. And I am the furthest thing from a scout. Um, yeah. You're already, t you're already talking about questions I'm going to ask you as far as the scout. Well, good. Thing. That was, that was foreshadowing. There you go. Yeah. We're, 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 we're playing something in there, but yeah, for sure. I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the title thing, especially expert. Like that implies that I'm some, especially with fantasy football, like that I'm somehow more adept at it than any other bro jabroni out there like so um, and i'm not <laughs> like there's definitely i mean there are definitely things i i know more than i like i know more about wide receivers than anybody should ever possibly want to know about but i still don't like the like expert makes me feel like i don't know it's gross, that, it sounds gross. Ex expert to me has like your always right connotation to it yes or attachment to it and that couldn't be further from the truth like i'm wrong a lot and it makes me think that your opinion is better than someone else's and while, while it might be for wide receivers or something like that, um, that doesn't mean someone else that does the work can't have an opinion because at some at one point, Matt, you weren't an expert in one thing. Right. And so at some point, I mean, it's not like your opinion automatically just mattered. I mean, it obviously progressed and, and got better and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. Yeah, expert sounds like there's some mountaintop that I'm on. And if you want to come join me on the expert mountaintop right. like yes. the at the top of the mountaintop and yes. gurus, another one that's annoying kind of, I mean, well, that seems like kind of more of a fun one. I don't, I don't know. We're, 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 we're riffing on titles right now. That's important. I guess we've never, I've never talked about that on the show before. So title stupid. We've just come to our first conclusion. Stupid that, done. Yeah. But anyway, so back to you, Josh, uh, as you are the guest on the show. So first of all, like, just like I like to ask everybody when they start the show, like, how did you fall in love with football? Like, as Ross Tucker calls it, like, how did you contract the sickness? Yeah, and first I should say that I'm at NBC Sports Studios right now, and the Wi-Fi is not great. So if you see any mess ups, it's on my end. Um, but and and Matt. The, the reason that I kind of got into football, well, one, my dad played football, not at NFL level, but in college. He played with Davidson, um, graduated in 1972, Davidson Wildcats. He played linebacker. He took them to, well, captain the team that went to the Tangerine Bowl, where they lost to, I believe, Toledo by like 42 to 10 or something. So my dad's a lawyer, but has always had like this, this football side of him. Um, what's funny is I took the football side and my brother, who's only a year older than I am, took the lawyer side. So um, kind of split that in half. But it, it's it's interesting because my dad has never been um, the coach type or the X's and O's type um, in terms of understanding the d nuance and the details of it. Like, in fact, he gets caught up in all the narratives, which I think is just hilarious. And he gets super pessimistic and, and angry at, at anything that goes wrong with whatever team. But then the other part of it is that in 1995, obviously the Panthers came to Charlotte. And I was seven years old at the time. And we had season tickets from that first season. The first season was actually in Clemson, um, went to every game. And in fact, I probably missed about seven or eight games from 1995 until 2007. Um, wow. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it, would, it was my life. Um, it really was. Like, if, if they lost, I would be upset until Wednesday. If they won, I'd have a, be on a high until Wednesday. And I mean, I kind of grew up um, learning more and more about it just, just from the Panthers. So if the Panthers did not come – to Charlotte, um, I probably wouldn't be doing what I am, honestly. So that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, right? Like your hometown team, especially when, especially when you don't have them, like from birth, and they become like a new thing. That's that's got to be pretty exciting. And, and it was the perfect timing because, like, seven or eight years old, like you want to go to those games and just like because uh, it was exciting and, and new and, and something fun and 
Um, but then you kind of learn more and more about it. And I always like, I don't know. I mean, I went to school for broadcast communications at Elon and didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I actually uh, entered with a sports radio station and thought I wanted to do um, that. Then I interned there and decided I didn't want to do that. And But I really like majored in football. And I always, like I remember back in high school, my two other friends and, and I would have this game where we would – like say Brian Dawkins and we'd have to say like what round he was drafted in and like where he went to school. And we all like have probably those little moments and, and things we look back on. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's always been something I obsessed over. Madden was a big part of my life. Oh God. Yeah. Uh, and Dude, and I like think that really, I think that really taught me a lot. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it was, I, I would play it all the time. I would always want to be the best player. I'm not saying like, I mean, I haven't touched the game in four years now or five years now, but um, there, there were little bits and pieces that kind of progressed my um, love and infatuation and and curiosity for the game, I guess. Did you ever play like franchise mode and everything like that? That would be the only thing I would yeah. play. Yeah, I, I, was, sure. I was so obsessed with it that when each game would come out each year, I wouldn't even play a game for like the first six or ten hours. I would just go in and make sure every player had the right – face mask and gear and everything that they had on. I, I was obsessed with it. Absolutely. Oh, dude, that was – my friends would make fun of me so hard. They are like, are you playing The Sims or are you playing Madden? Now? Yes. <laughs> Brother would say the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, so, I, Matt, I'm going to take control here. Because okay. ta talking about the Panthers, and I know that you became a Panthers supporter some – right, correct? Yeah, well, my, fam my family's from uh, like the Troutman Statesville area, and they still – are, are they, they really from the Saintsville area? Yeah. That's where that's, my dad's from. My whole dad, side of my dad's family's from. Oh, that's, that's crazy. Funny. Yeah, no, so they live – I mean, they – the Harmons as a family, like, came to North Carolina from Germany, like, in the 1800s or some shit, and they yeah. still live – oh, by the way, you can curse on this podcast. Okay, so. thank you. But uh, so they came <laughs> – they came from Germany or some shit, and and uh, so they still they're still there. They're still all there. My dad was born there. Like all that, I'm the only one that, like I'm now the new generation that is no longer there. But uh, right. yeah, they st they're still all there. So they're all Panthers fans pretty much. So I that's kind of the only team that I've ever really cared for because obviously I, from the Washington D.C. area, I was not going to care about that team. Right. So so what was the month of January like for you as a former? Panthers fan because to me it was one of the more self-aware moments and I've got some raucous NBC people behind the glass um, but it was it was this one of those really weird self-aware moments where I realized like wow something that I've really cared about when I was 10 12 15 like I just like it, it doesn't get at me like I used to yeah for sure and I, I will say this I am a very emotionally complex person and uh, <laughs> that's a weird thing to say out loud, but it's true, <laughs> yeah. uh, especially as, you know, a man and all gender roles are supposed to fit in. But yeah, I'm a very emotionally complex person. And like the emotions of being a fan were very taxing on me. I've written about this on, on Backyard Banter, um, especially with just how things were colliding in my personal life at the time when like the Panthers were their most obnoxious, like those those like Cam Newton, Ron Rivera losses that would just kill you at the last minute. Mm -hmm. That was so that was like. 2013 season 2014 I think um and so yeah it was weird because I was just like this was so cool this was all like growing up this was all I ever wanted to see was like the Panthers in a Super Bowl but I was like but then again it's like at the you know at the and I was I was psyched I was really happy and I was definitely like they were an easy team to root for but it just you still feel like oh this is just not the same as what you think yeah so to me in the last three years I've become uh, much more self-aware and again that's a weird thing to call yourself like that's like calling yourself humble you know but self-aware <laughs> but I, I always say like self-awareness is the most important trait that a human being can have yes it, it separates people and I, I would say we are the, of the same age um, separates yeah. people of our age I really I really think it does because a lot of people just go along and uh, just think about themselves and uh, act on their behalf and not really uh, even put themselves in other people's shoes just like um, like the simplest things, like at a grocery store or something like that, just being being courteous and kind and all that kind of, kind of stuff. But but self awareness, like I said, to me is the separator of people our, our age. And, and that was a big self awareness moment for me this year, was understanding that, um, like in let's say in two thousand three when they went to the Super Bowl, 
Um, I was a freshman in high school and I went to the game in Houston and it was like I cried and I could not get over it. Like, <laughs> like it, it consumed my life. It really did. And and now it doesn't at all. Like I got over the loss like within a night. Um, I was nervous. Yeah. But it was more like, wow, this is a cool moment. I mean, it was equally as much me realizing like this is something that I once thought of, like you said, um, could never happen and it would have changed my life and realizing at one point it would have. Um, right. Yeah, it's, so, it's yeah. weird too. I mean, when, when you do like, it, it is definitely part of like this job too, like this profession. And, yeah. and I still, I still struggle with the idea of being like a diehard fan, but also being like being an analyst. And I know some people, like some people totally disagree with me on that and that's fine. I know for sure. Like I could never cover it. Like if I, if you're a legitimate fan and that's the thing, like I, I struggle calling myself a fan because it implies right, right. like fanaticism and like obsession being irrational yeah i mean it's the same thing with like you know i mean i don't say this to offend anybody but it's just like the same thing as like being like a religious person like you you like you put on for that cause man and like i i don't put on for the cause of being like a right. panthers fan and like you know i i pride myself on being realistic about my you know my expectations for all things football and i think that being a fan is really it's really hard to and especially team like i don't know how people and again, I don't say this to offend anybody, but I, I don't understand. I don't know how people like cover the team, like cover the team that they're a fan of. Like to me, that's maybe it's a different perspective that some readers want. I, I don't know. But yeah, to me, I, it's just it's hard to do what we do and also be a fan. Yeah, no, it absolutely is. Um, but at the same, like I, I still feel so much more comfortable talking about the Panthers than I do any other team. Um, yeah. And, I, and I, that, that's a big part of it as well. Um, but and I also think not to skip ahead. But with that being said, I think staying in your lane can be, and the self-awareness of your lane can be just as important as anything else. Um, that is a very good point. Like you're, you're, you're like a draft evaluator. So in a way right. that like, it doesn't necessarily, like you can still, I think that's a little bit different than being like an NFL analyst and then like having these conflicting feelings towards your own team. To right. me, I, I don't, maybe, and maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't know. But yeah, so to me, like to me, if I'm rooting for, I, don't, I I root for like I, I don't know I, I root more for like storylines and players that I like you know being like somebody that covers the NFL from like fantasy perspective but it, yeah to me it's different than being like a fan of a whole team I guess I, I was having this conversation actually this morning in the newsroom about um, and this is somewhat switching topics but um, like how in high school and even college I was obsessed with March Madness and college basketball. And then now I only watch, I've only watched one college basketball game all year. And it's just, it's one of those things where I don't make time at night for things that don't um, impact my life anymore. You know, and I think that's part of it is, is, is staying in, in the lane again. Like I understand I'm never just going to sit down and have a conversation about college basketball with someone. So it just like doesn't interest me anymore. Um, but again, I, I think that, and it's, it's so weird to me that sports has been the biggest um, uh, signal or sign of me maturing. Um, but I really, I really think it has been. And in the last year and two years, that, that's, that's more prominent than ever. Well, I, I'll kind of expand on that because that is interesting to me because I would say just kind of just to briefly juxtapose it with my own path to being here. I sometimes I'm I'm honestly still a little weirded out that like I have a job in sports because like a football is the literally the only sport that I could give a damn about and uh, like I don't care I don't not really interested in like other sports and I think so much of, like so, I so much still view myself as like an analyst and a writer that happens to talk about football even though I love football and like I love everything about it but so. Uh, kind of expand on what you mean by like that's helped been a big thing in helping you mature yeah i mean so I, I think we always talk about ages in terms of maturing and obviously we do it in football too which i think is yeah is, that is, is funny, funny. <laughs> um but like 18 21 or you go to college and then you graduate and and i think a big part of it is actually living alone um oh god yeah <sighs> And, and to me, like once you live alone, like it's, it's tough to go back to having a roommate. Um, I mean, I'm, 
it, I don't mean just talk about myself in general, but also I don't want to completely generalize, but um, like I'm a really kind of boring person and <laughs> I like, I really am. And, um, but I'm, I'm very self-critical and living alone in Charlotte um, right out of college. Well, after I lived with my parents, which was another self-aware moment of, of you don't have a job. And so you can't like go out in public with your parents because you don't want to run into their friends and them asking you, hey, what are you doing? So what are you doing? That that scared me to death. So I like honestly didn't leave my I mean, I left my house, but I didn't do anything fun for like seven or eight months after after college because I was so nervous about that single question because I had no answer. I mean, I was helping Chad Ryder, who was at CBS Sports at the time and kind of being like his assistant. But that question just would like eat me alive because the, the thing to me is uh, my, my biggest fear is like disappointing people um, and disappointing my parents. And so I didn't want them to be there when I was asked that question and for me to answer it with an, I don't know, I'm just at home living there. But that's, I mean, living at home is a common thing, but then um, going, and then I lived in an apartment in Charlotte and worked for Roto World at home. Um, and there were days where like the only person I talked to was like the butcher at the at the grocery store, you know, um, and and then going from that to, as you know, live working in an office is two completely contrasting things. But I do think time alone and, and questioning yourself um, in terms of just reviewing what has happened like throughout the day or, or having these conversations about relationships that you have. Like nothing is more important than doing those just with yourself in your own head during downtime and silence. And I have I have a lot of downtime and a lot of quiet, um, and and I I do that probably more often than I ever expected. So yeah, that's a it's really interesting because that's a very strong parallel to like how things happened for me. And like I got out of college and I lived at home for like a very brief period, and then I got this job back in the town where I went to school which was a mistake, should not have done that. But I was, I was living alone and I went through this, this and I talked about, like I, I talked about this on the last episode with Rum for Johnny, that I'm not like, I'm not at a point where I like to talk about that a lot publicly, but I'm trying to get more better because I think that there is more to me than that the universe needs than just my football takes. Yes. <laughs> um, but, and I think that, so, so I was in this really just shitty period of my life living alone and the first, like my first year out of college and my dad, my parents also got divorced like a few months before that. So my dad was also living alone and the two of us like oddly had, like would have these conversations about like, about like, you know, the, like the only person I've talked to today is like the guy at the grocery store. And I, you know, it was like the, I, those like self-aware moments and yes. really like that, I think that helped me mature very fast, like for a, for a and, five, like 22 year old, you know? And it's at the time when most of other people your age are doing the exact same things that they did in college. Right. Um, yeah, like, exactly. like living the exact same way. And I think that that puts you ahead and put me ahead in, in, I, in I many ways. Agree. Yeah, I completely agree. Cause like that was, you know, being like, and let me, like I said, I was maybe not the same way for you, but I was, I mean, I was personally as a human being was was miserable during that time and yeah. so like that was the, the the that was what pushed me to be like i need to do something with myself i love to write i love football i'm gonna start a website and here we right. are now you know so right. and there's a lot of noise in between there but yeah so that that's interesting that that we've kind of followed that same path so expanding on your path there like kind of give us the josh norris story like because i know that you had some you spent some time actually in the nfl yeah. And then obviously ended up in Roto World. Like, how did that all come to be? Yeah. And, and like I mentioned, I, I went to Elon for broadcast communications, had a great time at Elon. Like, that if, if anyone wants to get into um, this field, I'm not saying football, but, but just broadcast or, or communications, it's a great school. It really is. I mean, everything's hands on in terms of student, media, and everything. And it, it was great. Um, but I had no clue what I wanted to do at all. I just always knew that football was the thing I I loved the most and knew the most and had these weird facts and and could memorize things much more clearly than reading anything out of a book. Um, and I always said that, like my like I mentioned, my brother and my dad are lawyers, and I couldn't imagine them 
like having that same feeling about practicing law as I do about football. But I mean, they must since they do it for a living, you know. Um, but going into my senior year of college, I first interned with Fox Sports Radio, then got an internship with the St. Louis Rams because and it was complete luck, complete luck. Um, Bill Devaney at the time um, was the GM of the Rams. He's an Elon grad. He opened this internship up with just Elon people for just Elon people with the scouting department. And I, I as soon as I read the listing on my phone, I was like, well, I, I know I'm the most qualified person for this. So I like I have to get it. And so got it and helped out the Rams during training camp during Sam Bradford's rookie year. So that was the 2010 training camp. Um, and that was only about four weeks, only about four weeks. And it was an interesting experience. Um, they've seen, and, and the best way I can describe it is they've seen a lot of people like me throughout the years in terms of uh, someone who likes football coming out of college or still in college that thinks that they want to work in the NFL. Like I fit all the cliches at that time. Um, I was like 40 pounds heavier. Uh, I, uh, one, one story that I always go back to is that the director of player personnel has this binder in his bookcase. And one of my jobs every day um, was just to go through all the, the news and find um, some third stringers or, or some potential players that were going to be cut and see which ones stand out. And um, so every day I would go through and like, look at the clay harbors of the world, look at some other um, potential cap cuts and, and see if any stood out just from a beat writer perspective or, or the team site and those types of things. And every day when I would put this back in his bookshelf, uh, he'd ask, well, what'd you find today? And honestly, every day I would say nothing. I would say nothing. And I, it's one of those moments that I look back on all the time because I could have potentially changed and like, I wasn't a bad worker at all. Like I stayed there until midnight or 1am when they needed me to, or even when they didn't, you know, but it was one of those things where I could have gone the next step, looked at the guys that even got a little bit of buzz, checked the tape on them, gave my little evaluation on them and said, oh, I actually found this and this, or gave him one thing per day that would have set me apart. Cause I was the only intern that summer for the, for the scouting department, but I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And I, I think it's because I lacked self-awareness at the time um, because I was just a guy going into my senior year of college that just wanted to graduate and like drinking and all that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. They like drinking too. That's a big thing in the NFL. Um, <laughs> And I feel like that's a big thing everywhere. Yes. Um, so yeah, um, finished up school the whole year, tried to get a job with the Rams the whole year. They invited me back for the 2011 draft. So that was when they took Robert Quinn. So I was in the draft room with them, the war room with them, oh, wow. um, which was an experience. And um, at the time I also had um, like 102 degree fever because my, Wisdom teeth were infected and I didn't know it. I like didn't know what was going on the whole time. Um, so yeah, but there were certain dynamics that I got to see and um, I try to extrapolate those. Again, it's only one time I've been in a room in a situation like that, but I got to see how the board was stacked. I got to see if they stuck to the board, which they didn't, and how then they approached the questions about that. Even the arguments that were happening about well, we want this type of player and the discussions and, and meetings that took place in the film sessions that took place just the draft mornings were super fascinating. Um, then it was a lockout, as you know. And so they really weren't hiring anyone. And so I didn't get a job. They hired someone else in August. And then it was like square one, you know, it was just work from home and do those types of things. Um, worked for basically free for eight months and my parents I have like immense gratitude for them basically telling me that like, well, your brother's in law school, you know, a lot of people go to graduate school, use this as your time as like a graduate student because there's no school you can go to to become an NFL scout, right? Right. Um, 
so yeah, then I got caught on with Roto World with Evan because actually of my Rams experience and Evan used to be a Rams supporter growing up. Um, and so he was just interested in some of the things that I found out in my time there. And then I helped them with the Shrine Senior Bowl that year in 2012 and pitched turning the college football fantasy site into a draft section. And here we are since then. I mean, there, there are more spots after that that if you want to get into, but that was kind of like the the inception, not the inception story, but the uh, how it kind of all started out. Yeah, the origin story. That's my that's my favorite term to use. I use it too much in writing. Um, but no, that's, and I think one thing that's a, a big theme throughout your story there, even without you knowing it maybe was like initiative, you know, like, uh, and maybe not based on your reaction, but I mean like with the, with the Elon like internship, you're like, I got like, I, this should be me. Right. I'm going to do it, you know? And then like, with, even with, with Evan, like pitching the site, like for Roto yeah. world, you know, that's like things, things in this world, in this, in this business don't often, I mean, definitely things just fall in your lap, but you have to be willing to be like, all right, this is in my lap and now I need to do something with it. And, and you have to be like, um, I, th I think it's so easy to be nice and, and many people aren't nice that like, I mean, it really is the easiest thing when you think about it, right? Yeah. Like it's just being courteous and kind to strangers and people that you haven't met and leaving a small footprint. I think that's a big factor in what's um, helped me get here is, is being kind and, and leaving a small footprint. Um, growing up though, like I'm, I'm a huge procrastinator awful procrastinator like that's probably why i'm not a good writer um is is procrastination is, is a big part of it um and i um always went about 90 percent instead of doing the full hundred um but yeah i mean i think everyone at some point there is an opportunity like you said it, pre it presents itself you do get lucky in that regard um but you have to take advantage of that opportunity and some i didn't and some i did and i think that that's the ones I did. It's why I'm here. Um, and I'm very happy looking back that it didn't work out in the other way as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, procrastination is such an interesting thing. And, and it is funny that like, Josh, you and I've you know, known each other on Twitter for a while now. We go back and forth about a lot of different stuff. Um, but this is the most I'm learning about because yeah, this is a fun part about me doing the show is I get to learn about a lot of the people that I've followed for a long time. Yes. And, and you know, especially because most of it's like most everybody that, that knows me now, like I've followed, you know, you guys like you and Waldman and Sigmund and all these people like for, for years before anybody knew who the hell I was. So it's fun for me to learn all this stuff about you because I'm, I'm seeing a lot of like parallels between you and I as human beings and, right. and as far as how we got to where we are. So that's pretty cool. And I hope the audience picks up on that as and, well. And, and that's, that's kind of like the stay in the lane part that I've always thought, I guess, applies because like I don't talk about this stuff openly at all because yeah. it feels so like i don't think that that's why people are are um follow and i hate the term following too i know it's, um, it is weird <laughs> it's like leader follower but but following the work or reading the work or just reading my my tweets um and it's it's it, i i actively think about like when big events and this this might be a weird thing to talk about but like when this is when, the podcast to talk about weird stuff when like sandy hook happened or all these other big national news events that everyone else is tweeting about or sharing their sympathies or doing all this stuff. Um, I actually like actively, maybe not actively, but I don't because um, for a couple reasons. Like one, I think if, and I've actually been told to like stop my work during that period. Um, but to me, when that happens, like if you were just stopping your life and and only thinking about this one thing, then the person that had was was the um, reason that that event happened has won. Yeah. Um, that really you should just you should continue what you're doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm not a very personal person on the social media platforms. Um, I don't have Facebook now. Uh, jealous. I do, I do Periscope now, but it's more just that, and I, I'm actually having a blast with those. 
I know um, those look fun. You, I tuned into the like your. The, I've seen you do them before, but I I'd never watched one. And yeah. like on Saturday when I chimed in on yours, that was the first time I'd ever. Looked they're at they're it. fun. I mean, I just go in there and, and and answer questions for fifteen minutes. But yeah, I mean, I, I rarely share um, things about myself. But what's what's weird is I consider like Matt, I've, and you might not feel the same way, but like I would consider you like a friend in a in an yeah. odd way, like you know, because I feel like I. I feel like I know you, but this, and this is something that so many people in our business um, face because you know someone um, or interact with someone so often, but like one, do you really know them? And two, then you might run into them at some point and then will that completely shift that relationship? Because it has in the past for me with some people. Absolutely. No, we kind of talked about this in the last episode with Rummy too. Like okay. we, we become very briefly, like, because, you know, we become so much a part of each other's lives. Like, yes, we, because we have spent unreasonable hours, like on Twitter, talking about this one very small, meaningless stuff, football thing, like in the grand scheme of things, what we do is incredibly, incredibly meaningless. And that's an important also, that is an important thing to, to keep in mind for me. Like, um, but so yeah, no, I mean, I totally agree. Like, I see you guys as like friends, but like some people more than others. Like, right. you know, and but that, and it's funny how like this is the first time you and I have ever communicated in a in a in a in a, in a face-to-face face manner. Like, yeah, but but it's been like especially before like we talked like 15 minutes before the that we started taping right. here, and it's just it's very easy. So, but these connections matter to people that are right. coming up like in the industry. Like, you know, you got to put like. Don't be afraid to be like, cause that's one thing I get all the time is like, people are like, I don't want to annoy you. And I'm like, I'm not annoyed by no. you like talking to, I'm not ever like, I'm never annoyed by somebody so, talking to me. I, I would rather obviously do this and then send an email, but it's, it's, um, and, and I'm talking about myself again, but it is this weird thing where I don't have like a ton of friends outside of work. And so, and I think a big part of it is that many normal people, don't have the interactions that we do, the conversations that we do online, through Twitter, social media, even through text, some other things. Podcasts are a big part of it. So they have to go, and have to is the wrong term, but they go and, and fill that communication void by interacting um, actually physically with other people. Whereas with me, I can go home and talk to all my internet buddies and I fill yeah. it the same exact way, you know? And then I can go and have my own alone time. And, and, and I really wonder if I wasn't doing this, if I would be doing that the exact same way, handling that the exact same way. Yeah, that is a good point. Like trying to explain, like if you ever are, God forbid, like if you ever are actually like dating somebody and trying to, like that is the weirdest, like trying to it explain is. like that to a, a to like a, a in, in, in my sense, like a female companion or, you know, whatever, like that is that is incredible. It is incredibly weird. Like nobody, re definitely people like that aren't a part of the world, like don't get it. And no. and that's fine. No. Like, cause it's, cause I'm sure it comes off as weird as hell. Like, and that's right. I'm and, okay with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I've been on a lot of first dates recently <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, it's, it's always something that eventually somehow comes up. Right. Um, and it is odd. Because you, you don't want to, it, it's it's odd to explain because you don't want to be like, oh, well, I talk to 35,000 people daily, on a daily basis via Twitter. And like, these are my buddies. And we actually, and they're like, oh, have you met them? Well, I've met like 10 of them and we're friends, but the other ones, no. Um, it's, it's super weird. It really is. But I think that that time for me, which is the Shrine game and the Senior Bowl, when I get to go and, and see people like Dane, like Fran Duffy, um, like Matt Waldman, like Gene Bramwell, a whole bunch of others, um, get to see them every single year. It's awesome. And, and I, I do think that part of it is, is the male makeup in that in many situations, when you see someone, you can just pick off where you left off right then, instead of having to recount what has happened in the last two years, three years, your entire life. Instead, you can just go from right that point And it's like, you never, you never left off. So, yeah. That's a really good point. And I want to circle back to one other thing you were talking about, which is kind of like talk, like being, being personal. Cause like, I agree with like half of, I agreed with like half of what you were saying, or I, I think like half of it applies to me, like major yeah. event, like major like events like that, like 
I have a tough time, like, then I don't know what to say. Like, and sometimes I don't, I, like, I agree with you. I don't say anything actually. And it makes me think of, um, Darren Page who always says like, you know, you guys don't have to have a take on everything. And that's exactly. like, which that is, is, which so, is great. So true. Like, you know, so you true. Really, whether it's every football thing or like, like even when Peyton Manning retired, like three months ago, they had me write like some piece about Peyton Manning, right. but I didn't feel the need. Like when I saw, what am I going to say? That's new that some people haven't, haven't said yeah, on Twitter like, and 140 characters. Like I don't need to t- like I don't need to be the three hundred thousandth person that has said like man, great career, <laughs> pay- great career, <laughs> pay- this tweet yes. that this tweet that he's never gonna see ever. <laughs> and, right. Same same thing with Calvin today. Yeah, like I tweeted my article both and both occasions I tweeted my article out that I had most recently written about them and that was my like that's my statement like I didn't need to be the yeah no I agree and well, like the Aaron Andrews thing that happened like why do you need me you don't, to yeah. talk about Aaron Andrews nothing. I don't need to say a word about it. Alex Gelhar, who I, you know, I live with and I work with and everything, like he and I talked about this. We were talking about this last night because we saw a couple people say like, and this drives me nuts, like don't don't be this guy if you're if you're listening. The one that's like, I, I, I wouldn't say this, but I could see how people would say this. I'm like, no, you just said it. Like you just said sure. that you th- – like, and I see people do that all – like especially with the Aaron Andrews thing. Like, oh, man, I don't, I'm going to keep my mouth shut about this, but <laughs> that, that really bothers me. And I'm like – okay you didn't keep your mouth shut though like just actually it's okay to like it's really okay to shut up sometimes and not say anything how how often how often matt do you type up tweets and and either save them to drafts or delete them without um without publishing them i normally get like two words into it and i'm like i don't want to say that Mm -hmm. like nobody needs to hear like nobody needs to hear that but at the same time, and it's usually in response to people, not you responding yes. to something else. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I always think like, yeah, I don't take that next step to be like to actually type it out and be like, I wouldn't say this, but somebody else might. I just am like, yeah, I would, I would say this, but it's not, it's not worth it. Like, it, right. it's not even close to to worth what I would get out of it. Um, now, however, at the same time, I am the type of person that shares a lot of my personal self mm-hmm. over social media so we're different in that way because like i'll t- i mean i talk about obviously charlie all the time uh, which has been important for my hashtag brand uh <laughs> and like but also like life events i think because and i i would say that especially like as a fantasy analyst maybe it's different being in in the draft world like because you put your like you put your opinion out there so much mm-hmm. and it impacts people's like it impacts people's in in their in their mind like a very important thing to them. Even though, again, in the grand sense, like your fantasy team really means nothing. But like, people get mad at you about that sort of stuff. However, I always say I like I feel like I am definitely in the vast minority of people. Like I don't I just don't take a lot of shit from people, and that's not necessarily because my predictions are any better than anybody else. Like I've had some major whiffs, but yeah. I think because I share a lot of a lot of my personal self, and I think it ingratiates like my audience into my life and it gives me a, a more like human perspective. So I don't know. That's right. something that's been really important. So, to me. I don't think I am there as a writer to um, discuss and implement life experiences in a way that Matt Waldman does um, in a way that actually like tells a story and enhances what you're writing. Um, to me, if I wrote about experiences or things of the sort um, or put myself in it, I would, feel like I'm saying I and me and just talking about myself too often. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I, I definitely need to improve. What, what I do think is, is interesting is obviously now, and I, I, I don't want to use the term sellout because I, I think I'm producing the content that people want to see most of, right? And for draft stuff, that is rankings and that's mock drafts, you know? And I blurb a lot too, but, um, there's not a lot of range you can do with those things, or at least I haven't figured it out. Like um, Matthew Barry basically does um, his love hate thing is, is very cut and dry, but he adds a lot of flavor to it and a flair to it and, and a personal side to it. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm still learning how to do that in many ways. Now on Twitter, I do think that the fantasy communities and the draft communities can be very different. Um, and, and one more thing about Twitter, I think that, your mentions are like a direct representation of you as a tweeter. Yes, um, you create the experience that you have on Twitter. Like because, if you're, <laughs> yeah, yes, like, I, 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 I see 
some huge national writers or even not some national writers, um, some ones with like the same follower count near me or below me that are always posting like horrendous things that people have said about them. Um, and like, I almost never have that experience. Like maybe once a month I have that experience. And at worst, they just call me a ginger, which you can obviously tell is not true. Um, <laughs> but no, but what I'm saying is I think that their work, how they um, discuss their work, how they project their opinion is bringing those people to follow them um, or, or to support their work and then respond to it. To me, like, again, I, I don't really get any of the, I mean, I might not have as much interaction as some other people, even though I used to respond to almost every single person. But I, I, I do think that your mentions and, and who responds to you and how they respond to you is just a representation of who you are as a tweeter. Yeah. I, I remember in one of my first few weeks at NFL.com, I put a tweet out there about Zach Ertz and – I, I was like looking back on it. I mean, I didn't feel like it was, it was it, like I didn't feel like it was all that bad. But it was basically saying like my my point was like Zach Ertz did not have like fantasy upside at where he was being drafted. Yes, I could have worded it like that. Instead, I basically like it to to my to the audience that ended up seeing it. I had essentially like doused him with gasoline and threw a match on him, and and that's how people responded to me yeah. and like. Instead of like, because you know, then at this point, like now at that in that stage, it's weird to say this, but like I'm a national writer with a shield in my avatar, like you know. Well, so does Chaps, but well, yeah, but that's a little <laughs> <laughs> he's also he offsets it with the ice cream sandwich. So, Correct. Um, but I did not. I just my just my stupid smile. But anyways, um, so like I had to learn in that moment that like you know a bunch of so obviously a bunch of Philly writers retweeted it, a bunch of Philly fans said some. Off. That's really the only. That's the only time I can remember like things being said to me that I was like, "Wow, that actually, that kind of hurt." Like that yeah. was that's hard to read. And I so in that moment, instead of being because I see a lot of people, and we talked about this kind of with Waldman too, like inviting the negativity because I would see a lot of people that would like you know, you know, a lot of people we know and follow on Twitter probably like would quote tweet it or like bring that out to the public, you know, and and then push back and fight back. But to me, in that moment, I was like, "Okay, what can I do?" to make sure that doesn't happen again because and I think that's important like if you're going to put yes. yourself if you're going to put your opinion out there like people aren't going to always like it of course and you got to know how to navigate that instead of like thinking that you know what everyone on twitter sucks or everyone on twitter is mean to me like there's a lot of good ass people on twitter there's a lot of good people in the world like you have but you have to invite good people not negativity yeah and and I think uh and and this is kind of shifting topics again but um, what I realize a lot with with writing and, and evaluating football, like I cannot stand when people um, try to emulate NFL scouting departments. Um, That's actually and, the next question I want to ask you. So <laughs> nice. I'm, I'm, I'm in your head. Um, it's it's something that I completely understand why they would want to do this, because that's what I wanted to do in 2011, 2012 and thought I could. Um, but what you're doing is you are trying to emulate what 10 or 11 people do in terms of evaluating the player, evaluating the person, uh, also evaluating medicals. Um, and I don't see how someone can be good at all three of those um, and also doing it for 300 to 400 people. Um, like I wrote this thing at the end of the Senior Bowl, and, and that was very much a summary of what I just said. But... Um, like NFL scouting is, is it's an odd business that comes off as glamorous and it's really not. And it's very information driven and they have so many more resources than someone on the outside. Like we do. Um, like I, I got to look at a ton of scouting reports while I was with the Rams. I even have some of my desks still. Um, and they have a gross amount of information on these players. And funny thing is every time that sometimes these, um, that, that type of information comes out about these prospects take, um, I don't want to use specific examples, but we've seen it with Cam Newton. We've seen it with some of these other, um, prospects, um, Jimmy Clausen, that the direct wording that NFL teams use in those scouting reports went out to the public and the public, um, destroyed it. They thought it was the worst thing they've ever read. So to me, the public is not ready 
for the type of information that these teams have. And I don't think that information is necessarily good information. I don't think that they should go in that direction, but that's what they do. That's how they do things. Um, but yeah, just as an individual, it eats me up when someone, even now, thinks that they can evaluate 300, 400 people at this moment in the process. Because to me, sharing your opinion on a player without watching them is like the biggest no-no. And it happens all the time. It happens all the time. Um, and then that same person will go back, and I understand changing your evaluation, like it's all fluid. But then going back and completely reversing your opinion after you finally watched, to me, is just a huge discredit to your the people that read your work. And I, I really do think that it happens far too often. Yeah, and I think that kind of goes into the idea of, like, stay in your lane, you know, find yeah. your, you know, because people ask me all the time, well, how, what do you think about this running back in the draft or this defensive end in the draft? I'm like, don't ask me, man. Like, I'm only, <laughs> I'm, like you, you need right. to find somebody else to ask, like, because – I've only done work on the wide receiver so far, and that's it. Like, eventually I'll get around to taking a peek at other guys. But also, that's not my – like, that's not my thing. You know, and I think that's something I respect about you is, like, you – I've seen – I've heard you say or seen you say, like, multiple times, like, I'm bad at defensive back evaluations. Like, as a – you know, from from a professional standpoint, like, again, like, titles – Probably not the right thing to say. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah, from, like, for titles and stuff, like, the lead – NFL draft analyst or whatever the hell your title actually is at a, at a big, at a big name site, like probably should be good at evaluating, like in theory should be good at evaluating DBs, but at the same time, like, but, but that's not, but, but you're being honest. And I think yes. that people, people, people respect that more than bullshit. You know, like if you were to come out and say like, well, actually I think, you know, DeMarcus Denard or whatever the Denard, I don't remember the guy, Alfonso Denard, who the hell yes. is Anyways, I don't know why I chose that particular player anyways, but like some, some random cornerback. No, he's good at this sort of this sort of that technique. And even though you're just like regurgitating things that, you know, I think people respect and, the honesty more. And, and another recent example is like Jalen Smith. Um, like people are like, whoa, wow, where, where might he fall in the draft now? And I, I just say I have no idea. And yeah. I, thinking, I think saying like I don't know is – something that should be said far more often than it is, especially in our line of work. Um, Cause even like teams don't know. Um, but we always like have to, again, it goes back to the idea, not just on national news or things that have happened breaking news, but in football, like you don't have to have an opinion on everything. You can be in, in wait and see mode. Um, and I, and I wish that was more, that was practiced more often, but then on the other hand, that could be why I, um, not where I am, but why other people might be getting opportunities out of me. So I'd say you're still doing pretty well. So, you know, but yeah, no, I mean that, that wasn't me complaining at all. Right. I, I just, um, I'm very aware of not, not knowing and I, I don't like to lie to people and fake it. I'm actually a really bad faker. And, and so like the Johnny Manziel stuff, whenever that came out, like, um, I couldn't just get up and go do a video on that because I don't have a worthwhile, solid opinion on that. Like I could never do first take, you know? Oh God. Yeah. Um, because I just don't think in that regard. Like I don't put myself in that situation and say, well, what would I do if I'm a general manager? Um, because I just, I would do things differently than, than many of them. So, yeah. And I think that is, is just for, for myself too. Like I'm the type of person that like when I care about something, I care 110% about it. Like I care too much. I care way too much. Or, you know, if I do something, I do it all the way, you know, if I'm, and that's why I'm actually probably, I'm never in like a fully functioning or I haven't been in years in a fully functioning, like long-term relationship, because if I do something, I like, if I, if I'm dating somebody, I want to be like all the way in it. And if I don't, like, I don't care. Uh -huh. Like yeah. I have, I, I don't, I have a tough time. I care so much about the things I care about that I have a tough time, like kind of caring about other stuff. Yes. Um, yeah. Like I don't have, I'm not someone that can just like pick up hobbies. Um, yeah. Like other than football, I cook and that's like all I do. Um, like I cook every single night. I cook breakfast on the weekends. I cook every single meal. And right. that is like my one escape. Um, I, it's okay. Let me ask you this question. What is like one thing? Cause I've been thinking about this a lot because I'm about to have a lot of free time on the traps over. Um, yeah. What, what is something like in the next year that you like want to accomplish unrelated to football? It, well, it's funny because it's actually more writing. I, uh, 
I'm working on a project that I, I don't know if I will ever, I don't know if I will ever publish it or not, but I want to, but I want to accomplish it. I'd like to write, like I've, again, it's mentioning more and more on the show, you know, like this, this period of my life that led me to here. I want to tell that story, but, and I recently just had somebody uh, convey to me that the best way to do it would be to tell it through music. So, oh, interesting. Like using, because I, I've, I played, I've played music since I was eight years old, and, um, and uh, you know, I, I love music, and I'm very like, I, ha I have a very like emotional response to music, and so I was able to like go back and pick out like for over the last three years, which really detail the story, like was able to pick out like a song, like about seventy songs, which is important because it's not one number less. Uh, uh, sorry, I was a stupid joke, but. <laughs> and 70 songs like that told that story and so now okay. i want to write like little short stories about each one and again i don't know if i'd ever publish something like that because it's incredibly personal right. and all that but it's something i'd like to accomplish interesting what about um, you little stuff like i want to learn how to skateboard oh um, god i tried that when i was a kid failed well, and and so i'm i'm very bottom heavy and so to me that's always why i can never like get up and like Ollie or kickflip or any of that stuff. I would love to like learn how to do that now. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Um, I, Cause I, I think many times when you write about football, you have homework. And I think it's one of the few um, careers that you never stop having homework because there's always more you can do. You can always watch more. You can always learn more. Um, and so I, I, it's not like I can just go home and shut down. Like I, I always have things to do at night and I always feel like I'm catching up. Um, yeah. Never ahead and, of it. Like you're never ahead of it. No, like I, it's, it's this, it's a snowball that you just can't stop. It just keeps building and building and building. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 um, I don't even know if I have an answer from, from, from myself, but at some point, with relationships, what we've been talking about, um, you realize that you are like completely content with who you are. Um, and I think that this is a big thing because I, I, I know people that go from relationship to relationship to relationship and that I'm like deathly afraid of meeting those people and meeting um, people when you are in like your mid to late twenties is super weird because yeah. it's not like college where you can basically piece together who they are and what their background is and who they've dated and all these things. But then when like you could just meet someone at like a coffee shop, not know anything about them. And they could be like one of these serial daters and you know, and, and, and so not having well, any information, kind of baggage, you know? right. Not, not having any background on someone, but yet trying to get to know them to me is like this, this complex, um thing that that we all go through um and so i'm still i'm still trying to learn how to navigate all that which is yeah weird. it's really it's really hard especially as the person that i feel sometimes that i'm i'm the one that you, you don't want to uh, this is this is really, really <laughs> well, i don't mean to insult you no 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 because again it's about being self-aware and i think sometimes to me i have a lot of like if somebody was to date me seriously there's some shit that they'd have to wade through in order to get there. And so I sometimes feel, but I'm also like, just again, and I'm not, I'm not like not patting myself on the back here because this is not like an area that I would ever want to pat myself on the back. But like I, when girls meet me and they like me, they tend to like me a lot very first off of first yeah. impression because I'm, I would say I'm just because of the person I am. I'm very personal that way. Like, but at the same time, like, so I feel like sometimes I'm that person you don't want to run into like at the coffee shop, not because, because okay. I'm not a serial, I'm not a serial dater, but like, I feel like somebody meeting, so that's why I don't, I don't really put myself out there to meet a lot of people because I wouldn't want to run into me, you know? So it's, but that's, again, that's really complicated and I'm going to swerve us off this subject because I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to delve too far into it. But so, but you do hit, you did hit on a good point there. Like having goals and things to accomplish like outside of football is really important. And like, I'm still in the process of like losing a lot of weight. Like I, so that's another thing I want to accomplish too. Like in the next year, I would, I weighed in the two twenties yesterday for the first time since like middle school. And like at my heaviest, I was like 315. So that's something I'm always, 
Yeah, I know, man. It's it, yeah. If you've ever, I've tweeted the picture out a couple times, and that's another yeah. part of like the last three years. The story I'd like to tell, like that, I think I have more to offer than football is like how to do that because it's hard and it's something I'm still doing. So having um, those goals outside. Of, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I really want a dog. Like I, I, I really, that. I, want, I really. Bro, want we a talked dog. about this last time we did a podcast together. Yeah. Like and I still want a dog. I I uh, just get the damn dog. Well, <laughs> I maybe I'm too. Um, self-critical here where I realize where I think I don't have enough time for this other thing that I would have to take care of because I go to the office four times a week. Um, do I then just like hire someone? I live in an apartment that's like, or a condo that I bought that's like 800 square feet, you know, and I don't just want to like leave the dog in the condo all day and just let it sit there, you know? Um, but I think having like, it's going to sound so you'll get it. Some people will laugh at this, but like having a companion like that would be like, would, would change my life. Um, maybe not as much as I think it would, but um, when, when you're worrying about something else and also have responsibilities about someone else, things do change because hey, you don't, you can't just sit there all day. I can't tell you enough. Like how that is very true. Like yeah. Charlie, as much as as much as people that follow me definitely, I think can tell how much like I love Charlie and how much I how much he means to me. But like, I can, that even it goes beyond that. Like, it would he, expand my brand probably too. So. It would. No, yes, absolutely. See, like you could get up on like Instagram and stuff like that, like yeah. all that sort of shit. Like now it's just love. food pics. So dog nobody pics. cares. No, see, nobody cares about food pics. That's one thing. Like you're talking about, you're talking about uh, like cooking, and then also like deleting tweets before you say it i have so many times like when i make a yes. badass meal i'm like i should take a picture of this and then i'm yeah. like no i'm not gonna be that guy so i'm sorry right. josh if you're that guy but no i'm not i mean I, I i never um advertise my instagram but if you want food pictures it's all on there so I'm i, gonna, I keep gonna, it away from twitter i'm gonna have to go find your instagram now but um so yeah, yeah like I, I kind of took up all your time. So if you want to ask me any questions, <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. I think the last thing I want to I want to talk about just before we before we get out of here um, is process because it's something that you are well known for always talking about. Like, I mean, your your yeah. podcast before was process the process. You know, like talking about process, and and I think that it's become more and more a thing in the community. Like, I talk about my process all the time now. So I, I kind of want you to just. Like, why do you feel like it's important to have that process and being dedicated to it? And also, like, how does that, I guess, how does that make your work better? And I think shifting your process and expanding your process may be most important. Because, again, I mean, I, I look back on tweets that people retweet from 2012 to 2013 when I missed on someone and don't even remember sending those. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I was a different person as an evaluator and as a writer, as a creator um, than I am now. And... Like I, I, I can't even remember tweets I sent like two years ago or a year ago or this summer. Um, but, but yeah, process is important because I, I think many people, and this is going to sound so cliche, but many people are results based or results oriented people. Um, but really if you have a, a solid process in terms of um, understanding what you think you can understand or understanding what you think you can evaluate, um, that's the most important part of it um, in, in that that will lead to success in the long run because you will fine tune, you will understand, you will watch more, you'll learn more rather than just pointing at the, the successes that you got right. Um, I mean, it's the example that we always give or I always give, but it's, it's the combine and athletic testing is, is the biggest changer for me because I used to be like the eye in the sky doesn't lie and all that kind of stuff. Then I realized it does. Um, it absolutely does. And you, in many situations, you, you see what you want to see. Um, but reading Zach stuff, Zach Whitman at three Sigma athlete, looking at the mock draftable stuff with Marcus Armstrong, justice's stuff, uh, with force players, like they're just these different layers that people put out great work and recognizing that great work and letting it kind of soak into you, um, is, is can really help you have your finger on the pulse of so many different ways of looking at the draft. Cause it's, it's this complex thing. Cause we're talking about people at the end of the day um, that, that I, I, I think trying to have all these tools instead of just having one your own way and designating certain percentages of the thing. Um, I, 
I would like to think it's 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 just a representation of, of me growing as as someone who tries to watch football and and, and talk about it. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but that that's just kind of how I look at it. It's it's um, it's just me trying to um, find as much good content out there, absorbing it and using it um, in, in in the correct manner. And and I think that that seems obvious, but it's not done enough. So. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, and I, th I think it also resonates with, like we like we've alluded to, like you and I are pretty close to the same age. We're both, you know, under thirty years old. Like, you know, we're, I think process represents like who we are as human beings. Like, we're still growing, we're still moving. It's, this is all very fluid stuff, and I think that that is really important. And that's why, that's what process it you know kind of implies in so a way. Go ahead. You've kind of seen, and I mean, with the combine stuff, like I gave that example, right? Like, what about, like, what would you say something that you've evolved in, in terms of how you approach football, approach even wide receivers specifically, or even, like, outside of football? Um, like, I, it's why I do reception perception is, like, charting and logging things and kind of being able to balance. Because I think the one thing about, like, when you just sit down and you just, like, watch a player, like, it, because – you can really fall into a lot of and, and and i wrote about this with drops like and how about like negativity bias and stuff like that um i i think that you can be so prey to falling for like high highs and and also dock knocking guys for low lows and i think that being able to like weigh things and use your brain in a way that you would in any other form of life. Cause I think like, and this is important to remember that like sports for many people is a release. You know, they don't necessarily want to turn it's, their, they don't want to turn it. It is like, it's just entertainment, right. but that doesn't mean that you have to turn your brain off for it, I guess is my point. So like, I think that using things that I learned in school, like how to like, cause my, my background is in sociology, like evaluating human beings in society. I think that and like how to properly weigh those things while also remembering that you're dealing with a human subject. I think that's how I came to, to do reception perception and logging things and charting things. And that also makes a difference in your personal life, you know? Uh, so I think I mentioned this on a podcast recently that like not mine, one of the other ones I was on that like one of the things that I, I learned, you know, in school and when I was working like in human services was if somebody like, if you're kind of in like a terrible period of your life or like you're suffering from depression like one thing that like i always would recommend to people is like just keep like a log of your day mm -hmm. and realize like by by the end of it by and large like on a day-to-day -day basis more positive things happen to you than negative things and yeah. i think that if you're in like that depressive rut like that when you suddenly look at like you look back on it like you know what this really isn't that bad like you know and also like throw it away at the end of the day and move on. And, and so I think that's and it's like stuff like that was how I landed on reception perception was like, if I'm just watching this receiver and literally logging everything he does by the end of a large, like a, a decent sample size, I will understand the player far more than like, well, I like look at these, even just like taking notes, like writing down, right. like made great contested catch, that sort of thing. So, so and, and I don't take notes anymore, which might sound blasphemous to people. That I, I mean, whoa, that's people might come at you for that. I know, but I, and, and it's something that, what you're talking about with notes, you are writing down when a flashy moment or a, a signal moment stands out. Um, so when you're reviewing them, you're only looking at the highs and the lows. And more often with players, it is the lows. So you will get this negative feeling when looking over them, whereas I just want a general feeling on a player. I, I want to figure out where he succeeds the most, and, and that's what I gravitate towards rather than just looking at my notes and reviewing those. And if I need to like rehash some some player or, or figure out something about him, I can just watch ten plays and, and remember who he is as, as as that prospect. Um, quickly, I don't mean to go in a different direction, but what what you mentioned about um, uh, your your background, I think that more importantly, just generally, uh, like everyone goes through something or multiple things that shape them into who they are, um, and those are the moments to go back to our earlier conversation, um, like those are the moments that shape you and make you mature and that you look back and do all those things. Um, because yeah, I mean, everyone, everyone really does have a, like a story and yeah, it's, it's that those are the reasons, um, and, and, and events that shape people.
um, without going into any specifics there. <laughs> No, it's it's it is so. very true. I com completely agree with you and can definitely endorse that from a personal perspective. But um, so I think we've we've covered a lot here today, and I think we've done really well. Did we? Um, I feel like I I like said some, but didn't say much at the same time. I feel like I feel like we said a lot, and I th well, I th no, I, this was honestly this was one of the more fun episodes that I've gotten to record. You know, no shade to the last four guests who all were great. I'm not saying that, but this was fun because I think it was a it was very different. But that's what's great about doing this podcast is like I get to bring on all you guys and you guys all bring a very different a different perspective, a different approach. And that's fine. That's why I also don't like have a detailed outline for any of yes. these. I got, want you guys to be yourself. And I think you, you were great at that today. So, no, I, 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 this was great. I think it was awesome. Um, is there any other like kind of parting shots you want to deliver to the audience? You know, anything else you want to convey before we get out of here? Um, um, probably. Uh, <laughs> Thirty can <minutes> later. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's. I don't know. I mean, I, I would say if you want to get into football, um, find something unique. Find your own unique lane that no one else can create in. That can do it the same way that you can. Everyone under the sun can write scouting reports, um, and they're out there for free for people to read. Like. I'm sure you get emails all the time. I do too, of people saying, hey, this is my resume. This is something that I wrote. It's the same thing I could go find in any site, you know? Find something individual. When I look for content to read and, and that interests me, it's someone that specializes in something. Now, it might be more difficult to find a full-time job in that, but I think that's a great way to start and then you build from there. Because I think if you start very unique and then you can generalize, I think that that is something that people look for. Um, and I always bring up you as an example. Um, because I think Alex said the same thing when after he listened to the podcast that we did a long time ago, that that um, your wide receiver work was was a big reason why you got a job because it is so unique. And, and yeah, I think detailed, nuanced content that is unlike anything else you can find is, is what draws people that actually work in the world, in the football world or sports world, and are actually hiring and, and presenting opportunities. I think that's what they gravitate towards more than someone that can just do what another hundred people can. And and I hate I hate talking about scouting reports in that way because like some of my best buds in the business, like Waldman and, and Dane, um, write scouting reports. Like that's what they do. But I would say Waldman does in a different way. And I yes, think Dane definitely. and I think and I think Dane um, emulates a team as best as anyone can in the media. Um, like he is basically a scout and has been offered those jobs um, in the media, you know? Um, and I think that that's that's very difficult to replicate. And yeah, again, that's the thing. Like, I, 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 I was I was in that I was in those shoes. I was like I want to do that exact same thing, but then you realize that you can't. And I think the sooner you realize that, the better. Yeah, that's the thing. Like you can't be Dane Brugler because there already is Dane Brugler, and like right. you know, like so be somebody else be yourself, be whatever that is to you, and find find out what that is, and try a few things and fail, like. I had plenty of bad ideas before I had reception perception and I, you know, but anyways, so yeah, no, I think that's a really good point to end it on. And of course you ended it on giving me a compliment, which is really the only reason, <laughs> it's really the only reason I'm doing the show anyways, but no, seriously. So thank you, Josh, for coming on. This was great. I think people are going to get a lot out of this and uh, you can follow Josh and it's important to do so right now uh, on, on this the draft season. You can follow him on Twitter at Josh Norris. I do. It's great. Um, most of the time, and <laughs> I talk about politics a lot. Yeah, all all his very uh, neoconservative food picks. political, <laughs> yeah, food picks, politic takes, and maybe occasionally a scouting report. Um, yeah. No, but seriously, yeah, definitely follow Josh. He's great. He's one of my favorites. But, um, anyways, yeah. So again, if, I want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, if, if you like the show, please rate and review on iTunes or your podcast app. That is super important, and I feel the need to remind you to do that. Um, but seriously, the interest has been great in the show. We've got a lot more coming up, uh, and so be yeah, be excited. I've got, got, got some ideas for some more killer guests coming, so it'll be great. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening, everybody, and I hope you learned something today. <laughs>